So it happened again. I was in an artist's studio recording an episode, and I felt drawn to an unfinished piece still on the easel. This time, before I knew what I was doing, I had managed to convince the artist to put my name down for it. This artist is, of course, Samurai Farai. So as we speak, Farai is finishing it up, and it will join the collection that so far consists of a Pierre Vermeulen, two of Paul Wellington's pieces, check out episode 4, and this Farai, episode 8. I've made an Instagram account dedicated solely to the collection associated with this podcast. The Instagram handle is the Art Investor Collection, separated by underscores. The idea is that as I do these interviews, I'll add to this collection when I decide I need to lash out and buy something. The criteria will be that A. I like the piece and I want it in my life, and B. I think the artist is investable. I'm going to keep a spreadsheet, and every couple of years or so, if you're good, I may even do a recon and update you on the annual return of the portfolio. These episodes don't usually have a long intro that you have to bear through, but seeing as I've got you now, I may as well use the time to explain what this podcast is all about. I've always been interested in investing, initially in public companies and then in startups. Having a vaguely artistic bent, I studied music at UCT, and being involved in coding in tech all day, I decided I could get my non-mathsy, non-cody hit in the form of investing in art. But as I'm sure you've heard, along with, if you have nothing nice to say, don't say anything at all, anything worth doing is worth doing well. Besides, if you're prepared to spend loads of money on a car, which is, unless you love old school just about to be a classic cars like I do, a completely depreciating asset, why not park, ha ha, some of your money in art, which may even make you more. But how does one become a successful investor in art? One way, I thought, is to listen to podcasts about art investing. Alas, there weren't any, and the ones out there didn't have a visual companion, which means that when the guests are talking about a piece, you have to Google it, and by the time you found what you think might actually be the right one, the conversation has moved on. So I started my own in which the idea is that for the second half of the interview, you follow along while the artist and I discuss a selection of their pieces. Okay, but who to pick? Well, what makes a modern artist famous? Their art, but also their personality and story and work ethic and the contents of their mind. In short, how they see the world. Clearly the best approach would be to pick artists for your collection at the early stages and wait for them to bloom. This, however, would be a fruitless endeavor without wide reach, some sort of inside information and experience to get you an edge to improve your odds. So how on earth does one get this reach, this information and this experience? Well, talk to many emerging artists. Often, contemporaries of great artists could see it clear as day that their friend and or rival was destined to escape orbit, so wouldn't it be fantastic to be able to visit artists in their studio and talk to them for hours about their work, getting to know them in a way that no rushed chat at an opening exhibition would allow? Starting a podcast would be a lot of work for you, but also pretty fun. Well, you don't have to, because this is what I'm doing to become a better investor in art, and you can listen along and join me for the ride. With that, let's crack on with the actual episode. I know that every canvas is alive, but it's more of the sense of letting the canvas tell me how it feels and what it wants to become and what life it is trying to express instead of me like doing an A4 sketch before and articulating that A4 sketch directly on a canvas. What's been happening to me recently is like a lot of kids in and around South Africa are like redrawing my paintings and like Seriously? yeah and like tagging me in renditions of that's it that's awesome you know so that for me is like oh like that's super cool yeah the whole kind of statement of something starting and finishing is also yeah. very tricky to me um, I believe that I just sell works that are always in progress but <laughs> you know but I'm the only one that knows I don't like to finish. I like to yeah. obsess. Um, a, a mechanic's car is never fixed. It isn't. You know what I mean? <laughs> Always, like, it, it the isn't. carburetor could be, like, tweaked a little bit more, like, get the right yeah. balance. Like <laughs> and literally, like, coming from three generations of mechanics. You know, not a lot of people know 
but now I'll make everyone know. <laughs> <laughs> I actually finished this artwork on the floor of the gallery like a day later than I was supposed to deliver it. You've seen The Radiant Child, the documentary. More than I'd like to admit. You've seen it like five times, six times. In the 20s I've now. seen it like, wow, I've seen yeah. it like three times. It's pretty no, it it's awesome. Now. Yeah. So you've got three more years to live, huh? Apparently. Before you, um, <laughs> before you hit <laughs> yes, um, before you hit the 27 club, you know. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, well, cheers. Cheers again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, you. You know that um, like ever since the beginning of this podcast, when I had like 150 like, or like 50 followers, when it was just like my family, yeah. like I wanted to interview <laughs> you. Oh, no. Thank <laughs> and, you so um, much. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I was like, I don't want to just... <laughs> burn that bridge by messaging you and being completely unknown so r rather um oda put me on to you you know that's amazing that's much Thank better you. yeah um yeah so let's start like w with the name let's do it well i start off by saying hi hello oh yeah yeah <laughs> <Forgot about laughs> my <that. laughs> name my name is samurai farai aka farai engelbrecht um i'm 24 years old this year and I'm a visual artist, painter, designer, curator, very much just interdisciplinary individual, I'd like to call myself. Yeah. And um, everyone always asks why Samurai for Rise? Might as well unpack that. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's so really cool, by yeah, the way. Thank you. Samurai for Rise is actually my creative pseudonym that was born in the third year of my art schooling career and i had this necessity to create a different identity one that was separate from like my government one because i was being kind of collided with all these critical thoughts of gender identity uh, race class and you know i really felt like in order to be the best creative that I had wanted to be, I need to disassociate from those kind of variables like my race, my gender. So creating a name that came from my own creativity through my own mindset mm. and, you know, the whole even ideology of being a samurai is one of like being disciplined, one of being um, completely imbued with integrity, but also like a ferociousness and a discipline. Um, and my main inspiration for the samurai kind of coining coinage was um, Yasuke, who was the first black samurai who actually was a slave taken from Mozambique who climbed the ranks of a very um, famous royal family in China in Hector. about the 14th or 13th century. Yeah. So kind of paying homage to that kind of level of historicity through myself and taking back my identity and also that's really cool like yeah. and so social mobility as well Definitely. Like discipline and uh, like if anyone has i mean if you've seen samurai jack of course i mean of i course. grew up with that cartoon yeah, it was my favorite cartoon 100%. because it was just completely different to the other cartoons on yeah. cartoon network How, i mean like samurai from the past getting hurled into the oh, future it was super cool and then he's like there on his Japanese like he's, wooden sandals. He's he's so awesome. Like and he's, but he yeah he yeah well such a role model like Definitely. he's Definitely. And, and he's um. He's not completely like you know what I mean. He's not like Bruce Willis. You know what I mean. Mm. He's, he's not like he, like he's fragile as well. But he's a human as well, and he makes mistakes and he completely. has feelings and you know blah blah blah. But like he's like disciplined and he's like honorable. Yeah. You know what I mean. And like, he, Super, I think cool. the whole conversation of anime and cartoons is also very, very significant for me in my life. Um, it was my first and still to this day, like role models were always anime or cartoon characters. Yeah. Um, I think the first one I ever had was Goku from Dragon Ball oh, Z. Yeah. It was, <laughs> I was just obsessed. I would draw Goku every day in school and like the whole Super Saiyan saga thing. And I think what cartoons and animation did for me was allowed my imagination to like exist outside of reality, mm. you know, outside of, you know, people walking. It's like people pl flying, people with powers and kids with superpowers and yeah. all of these things that I would rather invest my imagination into than like 
constructs of reality yeah, yeah, yeah. like religion money and race and time and yeah. so the cartoons were always for me a way to like suspend my imagination and broaden it yeah um, so, but yeah. also the pseudonym is like reminding you to not be like i'm someone doing this thing rather just do the thing you know what i mean yes. like it's you don't have to worry about, like think about your past or anything you exactly. just exactly you, you're just like it reminds you you know to to step away from your all, all identity and just make stuff you Definitely. know what i mean Yeah. Because, I mean, I think the whole identity thing comes with a lot of turbulence and crises, especially when the, the, the external world will kind of judge you on, the ident on your identity. I mean, that's just yeah. like bread and butter of how people function. Yeah. And I think to create an uh, identity that like runs alongside your, let's say, your government pseudonym or whatever, blah, 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 it's a really powerful thing. Um, Some of my favorite um, musicians have pseudonyms. Totally. Um, I mean, look at Wu-Tang Clan, yeah. Childish Gambino, um, King Cruel. Lady Gaga. Lady, you know, the, the list is endless. And, you know, in, in the visual artist aspect, it's people like uh, Retna, Ramel Z, um, Fab Five Freddy. Yeah. You know, these iconic artists that you don't know. Some Sometimes people go their whole lives not knowing the real name of like mm. they're the favorite artists you know yeah. that's that's also very yeah. perplexing to me yeah it's a little one. bit of distance also uh, definitely you know, as well definitely. um so yeah i mean i asked most people that come on the podcast like how's how's um coronavirus been for you like it's it's been crazy uh, very isolating yeah in the beginning in the beginning um maybe i won't go into my COVID story right now but the i think the learning process or the the fact that we can't run away from ourselves anymore because of you know covid restrictions lockdown levels and even you know having to wear a mask every day and having a curfew as a grown adult is it's really perplexing you know and like last year not being able to buy cigarettes um not being able to buy alcohol it's it's been interesting I, and i what i believe is i've always decided to look at the positives to any like traumatic event that happens to me and i think the positive side of covid for me was more time to get in touch with myself more time to um critically assess who it is that i want to get in touch with and um i think the whole covid thing is obviously constricted or limited our access to other people and other people's access to us. Um, I can't lie and say that art, my art hasn't been moving or being acquired during COVID. It has. It's just, I think the whole activity on the social aspect of gallery hopping and visiting mm. and that kind of aspect has really like slowed down. Full of a cliff, yeah. Yeah, completely. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's straight up. And I think now the internet is where everyone runs to you know and hence why using social media the way that i do um using my internet platform the way that i do i don't think i would have maybe found myself here if everything was still moving the way it was and having like let's say my instagram following completely hurled through the ceiling but not be ha having the access to go out and physically you know people have people have access to me has also been really something that i benefit from just because i'm a, i'm not like a social creature all the time i'm introverted I'm, rather yeah than very much hobbit like and in my burrow and i only really feel the need to go out when it is to you know stimulate my imagination have conversations that are like inspiring and motivational mm. um meeting up with other artists and yeah. doing things like that Uh, but COVID emotionally has been tumultuous. And but then obviously it would have affected your work then, you know. Definitely, I, I don't think it's possible for <coughs> any artist to ha maintain the practice that they would, you know, articulating pre-COVID, mm. during COVID. Um, I mean, we're not even. I don't know when we're going to see post-COVID, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> post, post vaccine. You yeah, know. <laughs> I mean, uh, hopefully, but. It's been 
it's inspired my work very drastically. I think I can see that a lot um, in the artists that inspire me and the artists in and around myself in Cape Town and the world. And I think there's also been a an interesting like acceleration in like the necessity for art and the necessity in like society for to consume art. I think people are realizing since they're stuck at home yeah. and have no access to anything that art can be, you know, a way to how do I say it can be an outlet it can be yeah. an experience um, if you're working from the same desk at home every day like you want it like and it's your house you might as well put, put a beautiful piece of art up you might to look as at. well get something yeah. to make um, that white wall look a bit better a lot of you know like um, you know like uh, well, decorators as well and like garden designers and things will um, have seen like quite good like seen their practices do, 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 do really well during yeah. COVID you know Definitely. Because people are redecorating and they're wanting to make their space beautiful, you know? Yeah, and people are realizing, like, damn, like, my home space is my nest and, you know, you need to curate that nest yeah. in a way that That's benefits right word, you. Yeah. You definitely do because you can go crazy at home. Yeah. I mean, I think we <laughs> all know that you can go crazy at home. Um, but, yeah, very much just taking it as a learning experience and looking forward to using all of the tools that I've acquired during COVID um, in a more productive sense when things maybe get back to normal, whatever that mm. means. I think that to keep your practice above water now means that you can probably keep it above water forever. Like yeah. if you can get through these murky times, yeah. there's no reason why you shouldn't kind of accelerate what's been happening yeah. now when the economy gets back and traveling gets back and tourism gets back. Mm. So just looking at this time as like acquiring tools and um what do we call it just like tactics of perseverance and mm, grit yeah yeah straight grit yeah. just getting that will and yeah getting more stubborn um I so what was your COVID story that you mentioned um <laughs> or are we going to get into that when we look at the piece yeah we can yeah, do that we can do when, that when we, when we get to the piece we'll do that yeah 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 we can um, do that yeah, so, you, you, like, you grew up in um, George or something, was it? No? I grew up in Johannesburg. Oh, okay, okay. Excuse me, so, I am originally from Johannesburg, spent my whole life there. Um, my mother is um, Cape Dutch Malay, uh, hence the Dutch surname, and my father is from Zimbabwe, hence my Shona first name. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the typical South African upbringing, I would yeah. guess, all yeah. boys school for 12 years, and... Uh, Afrikaans being my first language, English being my second, but also a reason why the artist pseudonym is so important is because I kind of got tired of people, people's reactions when they heard my name, you know, like, I'd be like, hey, my name's Farai Engelbrecht, and the same question yeah. I'd be given, like, my whole life, like, what, what do you mean, Farai Engelbrecht? Are you adopted? How do you, how do you have that name? How do you have that surname? No, 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 it's just like... People clearly put a lot of importance on your name, yeah. you know, and yeah. I just kind of got bored of explaining yeah. the same story because tedious. Yeah. yeah, my identity isn't my name, you know, yeah. it's and it shouldn't be something that defines me. Yeah. But yeah, purely South African and and proud. Um. So l let's talk about early influences. Like, what would you say your earliest influ influences? What where, where did, did you have a sort of um, one art teacher that um, particularly encouraged you or, your, or like your parents or something like that? I think if we look at earliest influences, honestly, it would have to start off with the cartoons that I watched. Um, the cartoons that I watched were di like directly affected how I drew anything. You know, I I always struggled with drawing anything realistic because never really believed in the whole realism reality thing it's always a tricky conversation philosophically so yeah. moving forward it was definitely william kentridge in my younger years <clears throat> just seeing you know a south african artist on such a magnitude in the world and just i guess his his technique you know the abrasiveness of the charcoal the description the the concepts behind it it was was amazing um and i definitely had 
one art teacher in high school that I would guess mentored me into just a space of like self belief. Mm. Um, my I guess you call it my marks for my practicals when I was younger weren't the best, but I had an affinity for art history unlike anyone in my in my year in my school like I was getting a hundred percent every exam every test on anything art history hence why I double majored awesome. so I'm actually have my degree in art history as well as in fine art um, and I think that for me was kind of what brought me into you know wanting to study fine art as was wasn't the practical side of it it was the the history behind it yeah. I, I, I see and I still do believe that art history is the history of the world you know mm. because it's cultural history it's yeah. it's the history of so many people in so many different times that somehow intersect cross continentally yeah. um, even domestically in like on what it's art history yeah. for me was just gold you know if you can understand art history i felt like you could understand human nature human thinking um and just the processes of society yeah um yeah my art teacher's name was mrs nietling i'll never forget and she just kept pushing me to to be the best that i could be and you know she was like yo if your prac isn't as amazing as other people's it doesn't matter you're still passionate about this and it's not about what happens on the canvas all the time or mm. the final product of the visual aspect. It's, it's also the theory, you know, and coming into that, or starting my career from that angle made me question my peers and my colleagues who weren't informed of their positionality in the timeline of art. You mm. know, like, it's very important for us, I believe, to know who came before us so we understand what it means for us to do what we're doing yeah. currently and what it will mean in the future for you know future artists and kids and individuals because right now we are making history it's mm. you know there's a very small group of people that are able to leave a mark but i truly feel like i am one of those people and i'm blessed to have peers and colleagues around me who are doing the same thing and I mean, my goal essentially is to be, you know, one of the names in a high school textbook that a grade 10 student gets to open up and write an exam about. Like, that for me is the, a dream come true. Yeah. Um, not necessarily an exhibition at the MoMA or the Tate. Um, oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah, it makes me think, like, well, what am I doing to, you know, <laughs> <laughs> to, to progress, to, um, you know, help humanity move forward you know um but yeah like it's not always about yeah the technique it's about the story as well definitely like like you know you need to have something to say um yeah and <coughs> i truly believe this this in this concept of there's nothing new under the sun yeah so that being said a lot of the visual aspects or characteristics or personalities, personality of the work that we create come from somewhere. You know, when you look at my work, you can definitely pick up hints, more than a hint, of neo-expressionism. Um, through other work, you can see um, versions of cubism. You can, you'll never see realism in my work, but there's always this sense of emotion and playfulness, you know, and I think it's so important for artists to look at their own work in that sense and ask themselves who maybe did something similar to this than me. Mm. Because if there is someone, then that person is a reference point for me to build on. Exactly. Yeah. And when you don't know your reference points, it's kind of like, where are you going? Yeah. Because you, you need to have a direction. You need to have a point that informs your direction and which you can start and build from. Um, and therefore, I don't believe that anything can be imitated. I think it's impossible for imitation to occur, even if someone tried to paint something that I've done exactly to the T, it's still a rendition of their creativity. Yeah, yeah. You um, know? E e e even if they look the same, it'll be someone else doing Com it. So completely. it's a different artwork. Like Exa it's a different, exactly. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah, 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 and it's, it's so funny on that note <laughs> that there's like a, there's a group of artists 
who I, I forget their name i think they're called like the imitationalists or something along those lines but they're basically consider themselves a movement just based on doing replicas of other people's arts mm. whether it's something from rembrandt or goya or van gogh or even something from andy warhol but their conceptual premise is copying yeah you yeah. know and just by doing that they already create a conversation yeah, and a know? movement or whatever you, you know? know and it's like yeah yeah we're copying but now we're relevant and we're, we're different but we're copying and it's i think that that was the last thing to do that was under the sun like everything was done and then they did and that. then they were like yeah we're gonna be famous for copying <laughs> like kudos to them <laughs> um yeah so um do you have like a process? Do you have something that like like a thread that ties <coughs> ties between all your work, like like the way you do something? Um, is it something that you like the, the way you go about something that like repeats? Like um, you think of so something that you want to express, or you you know do you I don't know start with the eyes first, or like so something like that? Like is it a thread that connects everything? I can yes. Always the thread that connects everything. The absence of a thread. Yes. You took the words <laughs> out of my mouth. <laughs> yeah, I can read you like a like yeah, poker, you know? literally, no, I'm literally <laughs> the words out of my mouth. And I only say that because of something I read um, a few weeks ago that really informed that approach in a very different way. And it was a, an artist in Nigeria, and he was speaking about how he approaches a new work, and he kind of created this metaphor of starting a new painting sim is a similar experience to going for a walk, you know, and he talks about why it's so important. I mean, like when you go for a walk, it's never really planned, you know, because you can't really predetermine anything. You can't predetermine leaving your house at X time and the sun being up mm. or the wind not blowing or, or, who you bump into. or who you bump into and the experience or crossing the road or, you know, there's so many variables that come from just putting yourself out in the world or in a, in a mental space that I would say come to you instead of you going to it. Mm. So I think how I approach any new artwork is always along the premise of how would... I start this artwork without predetermining what it might express. Like, kind of like, you know, Da Vinci was like, ah, oh, what is it? Michelangelo was like, I just carved the angel out of the marble that I know was already hiding in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You I know, that, yeah. and it's, it's the same thing where I know that every canvas is alive, but it's more of the sense of letting the canvas tell me how it feels and what it wants to become and what life it is trying to express instead of me like doing a A4 sketch before and articulating that A4 sketch directly on a canvas. I don't do that. And even with my mural work, which is to some the most intimidating work, it doesn't start, even if it starts as a sketch, it finishes completely different. You know? Intimidating to the viewer. Um, I would, I would say as an artist, you know, to, to, paint, on a to paint a mural is it's, it's horrifying because firstly, there's no eraser. Yeah. You can't go back. And, you know, if you screw it up, you've screwed up something that might be like a meter by meter and correcting your screw up is... Yeah. so much harder than not screwing up. And it's someone's <laughs> wall. You, you know? know what I mean? And you can't be like, yeah, that was a mistake. We're just going to go with it. It's, it's yeah. part of the flow. No, but what I've learned is that also by doing like all of my live painting exhibitions and just putting myself in like the public eye while painting, it's, it's always about a mindset. So I think the process for me is getting mentally into the space and when i mean that it's it's like letting go of like my attachments are either towards myself or in and around me and basically just making my mind very quiet or just focused on the act of painting and e expressing how i feel is usually just always happens spontaneously it's in the zone yeah it's always in the zone and it is like, I would call it like a, a mental space, a location that I go to with my mind and 
I can't have anyone talk to me when that happens. I can't have any noise. It has to be music by myself in that sense. And then just letting it flow. And then it, but a mural, like, if it doesn't flow, you can't just be like, sorry, guys, I'm going home. Like, oh, no, 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 I'm exactly. Back tomorrow. Like, yeah. on the spot. Like, I think Hell people yeah. really, like, um, like, I love graffiti. Yeah. Um, and nothing in my life would probably t- lead you down that path of thinking that. But I really, th- but my... Um, stepbrother was pretty into it at when, when we were kids and I think yeah yeah like I have a re- real respect for graffiti artists no like, definitely wow. like, oh. I mean if you look at graffiti artists too there's no pencil outline chalk outline it's like at most first layer with a white spray can to get the outline or black and even even then it's still a permanent mark you know yeah. the only way you can take spray paint off of any surface that's not like material based is with terps and it's it's a horror show yeah, like definitely. if you have to like get a <laughs> spray paint mark off that isn't correct you're either gonna spray over it and that's your only option like and people are watching you and you have to do it now and also like the, like the paints like i mean spray paint is bloody expensive good spray paint is yep. bloody expensive so yep. like there's so many like obstacles in front of like <laughs> definitely <laughs> it's yeah it's it's crazy like. and and the op- <laughs> and on top of that to building that skill there's so many obstacles to build there's, there's so much like anyway you know yeah. you know what i mean no, so completely. i just when, when i see that skill i'm just like oh my god that's yeah. amazing and i mean graffiti artists aren't offered the like how do i call it the pleasure of time and safety do you know what i mean yeah. and what i mean by that is graffiti is considered vandalism <laughs> so <laughs> you know what you, what you have now is like these vandals learning how to paint without erasers or going back because their practice is illegal Mm. you know so let's say a graffiti artist might only have 60 to 120 seconds to articulate something a tag a throw up any sort of visual language in a finite amount of time and that pressure that the the fear the anxiety is all you know part of the process so you know graffiti artists are able to complete something in two to three minutes for a reason you know because if they don't then they either go to jail (laughs) get thrown in prison get thrown crazy fine have your paints like taken from you and i think it's also interesting to see how um like societal variables affect artists you know and like if you ask someone that is a indoor realism painter that you know commit 70 to 80 hours of painting to do something in five minutes they're going to be very challenged i can tell you that for free because yeah, yeah. be like what do you mean I'm, i've got five minutes no but if you ask a graffiti oh, but, artist but cr- critically i just want to point out to everyone that like, you, you can, you can, you're not asking them to do a ma- like a like a landscape like oil painting in five minutes you're asking them to do something of value in exactly. five minutes just anything do something anything of value in, in five, five minutes, minutes. yeah they would literally look at you like you're joking, yeah. you know? But if you ask, let's say, someone who's only done graffiti to imbue 80 hours into a wall, be like, dude, I only need four. Yeah. You know, I only need three. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like, what do you mean I need 80? I can do five walls in 80 hours. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, like graffiti, like it's planned out as well. It's like, it's intense. It's like Tetris as well. Like it's, it's, a, it's a big thing, you know? Um, yeah. So Stan Pinker wasn't like an old school. Well, he was like, he was kind of family. Um, okay. So this m- reminds me of a picture. Uh, I mean, it reminds me of a time when. Um, so so Stan Pinker was my grandmother's like, um, like um, off boyfriend. I, w- I guess in the okay. l- like partner. Yeah, the, the partners. They were partners later on in life. Um, and he was a, s- a famous South African um, painter. Um, and when I was very young, he was still alive, and I went to him and I said, Can "You draw me something, you know." And w- it was an a a four piece of paper with yeah. a cray, well, with like a an, like a, a board marker that was frayed at the edge and w- it didn't have much ink in it. Anyway, but that was the tool that he had, right? Yeah. And so he did a um, he did a like a dot a cow, but in dots, and wow. it was it was beautiful. Um, and me, you know, at, I don't know, eight or whatever, I was still thinking like, okay, this is awesome. But also like, this is valuable because yeah. Stan is like his paintings sell for like, you know, whatever. Like, yeah. 
Um, and then, so yeah, I, I was thinking about art investment even back then. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> my stepsister found it. And Recently. I'm no, no, no. Um, she was, oh, I was like six, she was nine, or I was eight and she was ten or something like that. She found the piece of, sh- sh- so I left it somewhere, like in the kitchen or whatever, and she found it and went over it with a better pen, like fixing the, because the, uh, the other pen was. Yeah, yeah, it was frayed, obviously. So she went over his work. With the proper marker. And I was just like, I was so upset. Yeah, you're like, you screwed it up. Even as a kid, I was like so upset. You screwed it up. <laughs> yeah. It's actually funny, I just forgot to mention that um, my uncle was actually a painter. Um on my dad's side so it was like any time spent at my dad's house there was always like three can large scale canvases getting worked on by my uncle at at any certain t- point in time going to one of his shows in somewhere in Joburg and he would always like talk to me on like I remember the first time I came home to him with oil pastels I think I was in like grade two and he was like where did you get these from? And I was like, no, it was on our stationery list at school. And he was like, this is absolutely ridiculous. Like, you're way too young to be using oil right now. Like, no, only adults <laughs> and masters can use oil, anything. And I was like, why is this guy bugging? Like, <laughs> like I'm just trying to make something, you know? Mm. And I guess that for me kind of demystified the whole art thing because someone in my family was an artist and had that touch point yeah Yeah, it was just normal it was like yeah cosmos is painting something else again or he's got another exhibition so the whole uh, how do i say idea of following art as a career was there yeah it didn't know? seem so like, yeah foreign, it wasn't you know? like <laughs> maybe he wasn't and i mean he wasn't the most successful artist but he was an artist yeah. nonetheless for a lot of time in his yeah, life yeah. um but it is very interesting to think about how something like that like getting having a drawing that someone maybe doesn't understand the value or sentimentality of and like let's say going over it or drawing over it but then also knowing like that's now considered a collaboration you know I should, yeah but i should have kept it <laughs> yeah like that's a collaboration between two people even though yes it was a bit of a screw up but it's beautiful t- i always think it's beautiful when people's creativities intersect um What's been happening to me recently is like a lot of kids in and around South Africa are like redrawing my paintings and like Seriously? yeah and like tagging me in renditions of That's it. That's awesome. You know, so that for me is like oh, like That's super cool. Yeah, and first I remember the first time like one of my paintings, I think one of my fans like digitized something and like screenshot something and put it on a T-shirt. And was like, hey, I did this out of like love and support, blah blah blah. And I, I completely freaked because I was like, you didn't ask my permission, and blah blah blah. You know, copyright, this this that. And um, my mentor actually, Atang Shikare, advised me on just like letting it happen, like let it happen yeah. naturally. Because first and foremost, you can't control that, yeah. and the energy and time that gets put into trying to control something like that is just disadvantageous especially like if I want to keep making work and it's also a way of like people showing me that they enjoy my work and are inspired by me you know yeah, you yeah. think you start drawing the work that resonates most with you like copying it I mean yeah if people are making uh, like t-shirts of your of your stuff yeah like th- you're not paying for the t-shirts like they're paying for the t-shirts yeah like Pretty much. E- even if they make no money or if they lose money o- on that business venture, then you get free advertising. You exactly. Know? So. And, and why would you, they be making a picture like you have, you know, it, it's like if you weren't someone, like if it wasn't valuable, why would they be making like well, Exactly. You know? Why would you make yeah. a copy of it if it yeah. wasn't valuable? That's super cool. Do you remember when you were six or eight how, um, how old someone or how grown up and how uh, unreachable uh, like a 24 year old was completely Do you remember that? I remember that. Like, <gasps> so that's what they think of you yeah like. it's, it's so funny that you mention that though because i often have these like epiphanies with like my mom mostly and i'm like because like my uncle is only nine years older than me 
And then I have another uncle who's only four years older than me. So I was always like so enamored by them when they'd come to the house or X, Y, Z. And now, yeah. I mean, like I turn 25 next month and I can't believe it. I like, it doesn't feel real to yeah, me. Yeah, the I distance still, shrinks. You know? Yeah, I, to be honest, I still feel like a kid, you know. I, I don't know when I start calling myself an adult or a grown man. I, I don't know if there is a point. Yeah. But yeah, it was so crazy to think like when you're younger, anyone older than you by like more than three or four years is just, yeah, like on a pedestal, I guess, to some degree. Mm. Just really out, out, like, yeah, like you say, like unreachable. Um, I try not be that, you know, especially for people and kids that try to connect with me or want to work with me or ask me for advice on starting to be an artist how to be an artist it's something that i really am present for it's just really hard to like commit yeah of course so it's much it's time, it's time to thing. responding and but i think you, yeah i would definitely do that like as well because i don't know it's, it means something it really does definitely and you know when you're on your deathbed if if you're 82 or if you're it's next year because you have cancer of the bollocks you will um, you touch wood <laughs> when, when you're on, on, on your de- uh, deathbed you'll be like you know I didn't do that enough or like yeah, things like that true you know? true that holding fingers that that isn't the case <laughs> next year yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> what else do we have here um, I, I write my um, interview questions in Python. <laughs> that is ridiculous. I was about to ask, like, is that binary? <laughs> 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 like, you're such a coder. <laughs> I'm like, this is easier to use than Word. <laughs> um, so, yeah, one of the, like the, one of the set questions I ask, and I think is really interesting, is um, like. Uh, do you feel like you've reached a point now where you feel confident in like, 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 to know like w- it, wh- where a painting is going and like when it's done, you know, like, or did you have that confidence, you know, or? It's a great question, first and foremost. Um, I truly believe personally that nothing is ever finished. You just come to an understanding that if you don't stop now, it might become a mess. You it know, might get worse. It yeah. might become a, yeah, and I don't okay. mean that in the sense where like a parabola, like you've reached the turning point now. Yeah, and you know. The more you add now, the more yeah. <laughs> so I think I think the confidence aspect in that question comes from being able to step back from a painting and saying enough now. You know, the confidence of stepping back and saying I'm confident enough to not add, alter, change anything from this point because there's probably a million things that I can change, Mm. but those million things that I can change, I'm only seeing. That's the funny thing about it. It's like, artists have trained eyes. Your layman doesn't have a trained eye. Most people can't tell you if something is hanging skew or straight unless it's significantly off, you know? But focusing and doing, like, focusing your visual, or your, like, your optics on art and lines and shapes, color, every day it's a skill you know you you gain experience in like training your eye so the confidence i think that i have now is it's come from a lot of failed experiments but i don't believe that i can fail as well so anything that i do let's say and this is a funny thing about me is that i can work on a painting for almost two or three years and just because it's, let's say I finished it in 2019, doesn't mean that I won't change it in 2021. So the whole kind of statement of something starting and finishing is also yeah. very tricky to me. Um, I believe that I just sell works that are always in progress, but <laughs> you know, but I'm the only one that knows. Like if I have a commission and I send my, my client a picture and I'm like, hey, tell me what you think. And they say, it's absolutely stunning. It's amazing. I'm enamored. When are you sending it up? That for me is like, hm, thumbs up, stop working, yeah. on to the next thing. You know? Um, but when it's more a work of my own, then it really starts to get tricky because 
I don't like to finish. I like to yeah. obsess. Um, a, a mechanic's car is never fixed. It, it isn't. You know what I mean? Always like. <laughs> It the carburetor could be like tweaked a little bit more, like get the right yeah. balance. Like <laughs> and literally like coming from th three generations of mechanics Seriously. on my mom's side. Yeah. Um, well, one of the first things I like traded was like um, old motorbikes out of my my parents' um, garage, you know, so buy them, fix them up. Uh, bit, you I know. mean, I, you got to love it. Um, I'm like a metalhead, like cars, bikes. My granddad um, owned a Volkswagen. Um, I'm not missing Volkswagen. Four GLS Cortina, three liter, and it's 37 mm. years old. Yeah. It's been in the family that awesome. long. And my granny's granddad was a mechanic in two world wars. So, you know, my gra my opa was always complaining, like, ach, Verni, the carburetor is rechi, And I'd be like, but didn't we work on the carburetor like yesterday? Like, you yeah. know, just so that mentality is also, I guess, in my family, we're all very perfectionistic but also obsessive in the sense where you can reach a level of perfection and then still find that one thing that's wrong yeah. you know and i'm practicing at like seeing what's wrong and like letting it be yeah you know letting it be like it's okay but um so so like um but at some point it's gonna feel like that's the work you know what i mean like you can't tweak it anymore like I don't know, for instance, like f for the company I work for, um, it's a very new project, but like they have a logo. <coughs> and the other day I was looking at the logo and I was like, okay, I get it now. Like I can feel that brand, like, you know what I mean? Like the brand, it feels like it's a thing now. You know what mm. I mean? Like, like the brand has um, that essence. It has like um, content for me, you know, yeah. that, br that logo. Whereas before it didn't, um, from seeing it enough times and stuff. So yeah. does it happen to you with like your paintings like once they're like on show like that's the painting is it done now like yes that that definitely is and if, if you viewed it because you've seen it so many times like if you were to, were to change something like it wouldn't be that yeah. painting anymore right? yeah i mean there is a definitely like a a point of no return and that usually is when other people have seen it like it's become yeah, like a yeah like you've opened memory. it up to the public for sale now like <laughs> you can't really go and change it especially Like, if I go into my one collector's home and I'm like, hey, <laughs> <laughs> this, <laughs> this artwork I sold you last year. Uh, it's not it's, finished. <laughs> yeah, it looks great. Uh, do you mind just unframe, unbox it quickly? I just want to touch up um, the, the blue on the left. Like, that's not realistic, But you know? What if, like, um, like you were doing something, like you, were, you felt like you were 70% true with it, and then you, you put it on Instagram or something, and then, like, like, it just went viral, and, like, like a whole bunch of people saw it. Um, it would like kind of feel like, like now that's the artwork. Or to not. a degree, I think I've always let myself be the power that determines when anything is concluded. You know, even when my gallerist um, will say that looks amazing, bring it, and I'll be like, listen, it's not done. Yeah. Um, but then they o there is also the realistic conversation of like artists needing money and needing money like with urgency. So as well as me being obsessive and perfectionistic, if there's an like a economical demand for my work, like in the moment, mm -hmm. I would rather choose to let someone acquire that work that is completely enamored with it mm -hmm. and move on to something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think the the aim as well for the paintings or any work is for it to find a home that yeah. is that is part of the equation is for it to be bought and sold or put in a collection and enjoyed by the world yeah. not just myself yeah. so it's important for me if someone shows interest like hey i would love to collect that work as it is you know good for you then that's yours but if i'm if that work is still in my possession I kind of treat it like a journal in that sense. Like that's why there's always like a, a few works in and around my space that I work on. And there's a few paintings downstairs in the gallery now that I know that I want to go pull off the wall and, you know, change a few things of. Yeah. But the things that I change will always be very minimal. You know, mm -hmm. like I said, my paintings do get to a point of no return where the only way to change the painting is to like... Make it worse. <laughs> yeah, or just black it out and start again, oh, yeah. you know, and... 
have done um, that a few times. But yeah, on the working like working capital for the artist like conversation, like people um, people think like it's very glamorous to be an artist and whatever, and then they might see your work or someone's work sell for like 40, 50K or whatever, and they might think like, that's, that's a lot. Yeah. But that, at this level, like that money's going to go to be buying petrol and food yeah. and like rent. art supplies and rent and stuff. Yeah. Like you are literally giving them working capital to make more art. Literally. That's what you're doing at the moment. You're like, not feeding any lifestyle. Yeah, it's not <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> Rolex watches and stuff. Like, yeah. it's <laughs> like when it gets to Francis Bacon's like... Um, level then yes yeah. that's William you, you can mm -hmm. um <coughs> you can argue that like yeah i mean they tell you can totally buy a car from like a work of art sold oh, at that level yeah like you know buy a house like that's like the dream he, he was charging like a million million pounds in like the 80s like Dude, like what it's like ridiculous that's <sighs> like just anyone who wants to work out what that is just go on google and say one million pounds in 1981 or compared to now and then click go and it'll like you can go to these like inflation calculator um websites <laughs> that's <laughs> In a Rand, lot of it'll money be crazy. Anyway, yeah. um yeah but yeah it's always and you can't compare yourself to like that's a different like completely guesses. different league it's like marvel versus dc it's like some people are just you know as well because of like social inequity is also a conversation but Artists, you know, in South Africa historically didn't have the opportunity to sell at that level, but still w reached such a magnitude of importance, you know, like our Peter Clarks, our Ernest Mangobas, um, even I would say um, the famous jazz musician, I forget his name, Hugh Masekela. Oh, yeah, like, yeah. these are all significant artists or art personalities from our country that left in exile, you know, to pursue their career. And, yeah. I mean, you go try buy a Peter Clark now. You know, you, you know, it's going to be really difficult. <laughs> <laughs> you know, be really difficult. Cool. Um, so, yeah, so the one last thing. Um, yeah, I, I want to ask you about ba Basquiat. Like, how, like, has it been an obsession for you? Like, Definitely. I mean... Uh, have you you've seen The Radiant Child, the documentary? More than I'd like to admit. You've seen it like five times, six times? In the 20s I've now. I've seen it like, wow, I've seen yeah. it like three times. It's pretty no, I'm in it's the 20s awesome, now. yeah. yeah. Um, so you've got three more years to live, huh? Apparently. Before you, um, <laughs> <laughs> before you hit. <laughs> yes! Um, yeah, before you hit the 27 Club, you know? Yeah, it's. I think I'm very much obsessed with Jean Michel and. I think I was obsessed with him before I knew him, especially or just knew of his work. Yeah. I mean, if you also look... It's in the public consciousness. It's definitely like, in the collective consciousness. Yeah. I mean, people were like calling me a version of Basquiat before I'd ever come into contact with any of his work or his identity. And um, I think the first time I watched The Radiant Child, I thought like someone was playing a joke on me because I was like, the m yes, my work is also very similar, but just the upbringing and the approach on life and you know Jean Michel was very much an interdisciplinarian you know he made an album yeah. in a very Dadaist technique where they were literally just like banging on pots and pans and he was playing like I think it was a flute or some wood yeah. instrument that, and clarinet, it wasn't it? it was the clarinet exactly and that album is crazy yeah. like and I think where I relate for him is maybe not yes in the visual aspects of the work but also emotionally i think observing like uh, like how he goes about explaining how he feels that people call him you know like a black artist or an african artist or just those connotations and how he d dealt with those connotations i think i was dealing with them before and hence the samurai farai and then only after Samurai Farai came about did I come across, you know, the whole Samo campaign that him and his friend did and the writing systems. And then I started doing that at art school, you know, where I was like, let me have my pseudonym character be someone that criticizes how we live our lives as people, you know. Let me criticize, like, the capitalistic society. Let me criticize politics. Let me criticize 
you know, race prejudices and conceptions of inequality and class. And let me do it from a safe position, if that makes sense, where Samurai Farai can talk about whatever he wants, but as soon as Farai Engelbrecht starts talking about politics and race, it's a whole other conversation. Mm. Um, but I think ever, like, ever since I was young, there was always a need for me to express emotion um, which I struggled with like in and out of therapy and psychologists since I was seven and losing my father when I was 11 to cancer and just a very, very tumultuous and emotional upbringing. So my art was always a way for me to express emotion. It wasn't meant for me to draw a still life in the best way possible. Yeah, yeah. You know, anything that I did through like mark making with my hand had to express how I was feeling. If it didn't express how I was feeling, I, I wouldn't do yeah, it. And yeah. still to this day, um, I think now the challenge is letting go even more to more to a higher le degree of like my conception of what is palatable and what isn't palatable. I think I'm still like holding back a lot of myself in my art because I'm afraid of like how people will see it. I think. As much as like the work looks like crazy now, it's, there's still like a huge part of me that's feeling like it just wants to bust through, and it's coming. It's slowly. It's a process, but the 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 like the, the neo-expressionistic tactic, um, as well as the cubistic tactic, I think merging them is like it's like a very important language because cubism and neo-expressionism are based on like conveying emotion, mm -hmm. conveying a uh, different perception in let's say cubism's right where I think it was Barack and Picasso, you know, like the, the nude declining the staircase looks like an image seen from like a hundred different mm. points and angles. And what that for me meant mentally was like, how do you look at one thing from different angles? other people's perceptions the perceptions of yourself in from a hundred other angles as well and i think when you look at my work now like the portraiture is people and versions of myself looked at from different angles from different eyes and i try to use let's say the mark making of like an expressionist to like bring it to life and then the line work of a cubist to kind of show the perception um so I can always do like some insane expressionist background with intense mark making and then just kind of conclude or summarize the hysteria of the background with a very strong cubistic black line and that, that actually creates form, you know, so yeah. I'm um, definitely obsessed. But yeah, like I uh, just see what you're talking about now, like this one in here, I'll put a picture up I think or yes. something I'll put a we picture will. somewhere but this one we're looking at in the studio like it is like an x-ray you know there's like a bland mm. turquoise like thing and then there's an x-ray through and there's like colors multitudes of, co of yeah. layers underneath so yeah I totally get what you're talking about yeah it's yeah and I think my work really tries to show like what people are really thinking and feeling inside like beneath the surface compared to how they might seem. Um, I think because everyone, especially like because of COVID, has come to understand to some degree that there are very, there's a various versions of ourselves, you know. Um, I think there was a famous artist, might have been Matisse, who said, um, there's a face that you show to the world, there's a face that you show to your family, and then there's a face that you only show to yourself. Yeah. You know, and I think that theory is very, very profound because it's very true. I yeah. sometimes believe that there's more than three versions that we have and that we sometimes cycle through versions unconsciously and consciously, <laughs> whether it's like to be socially acceptable or to be maybe desired and wanted by a potential person or if it was a job offer or you're going to a casting or, you know there's like just you're with your girlfriend or you're yeah. um, at church or you're at the poker table like yeah, you know very different. I mean. <laughs> you know it's like the person that you are with your girlfriend isn't the person you are with your girlfriend's parents yeah you know what i mean like and there's nothing wrong with that it's it's just human nature humans yeah, yeah. are complex creatures and i really enjoy making art that 
describes that instead of something that maybe wouldn't challenge it and just kind of falls by the wayside and tries to be beautiful. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. So. Cool. Let's so let's get into the pieces. Mm. Um, so yeah, this is the segment of the interview where the art artists and I discuss five to ten works of theirs, um, like covering in whichever aspects and in whatever, whatever level of detail they're comfortable with. Like they could flip through like the first four and then talk at length about the, the first one. It's all about the artist. Um, and if you're listening to this as a podcast, like i.e. not on YouTube, um, then you know the idea is that you open up Instagram and you follow along with the numbered pieces as we talk. So as we go from number two to three, I'll say, okay, cool. We're moving to number three now and then you guys can follow along. Um, yeah, and I'll see you in the comments basically. Um, cool. Cool. Oh yeah, it's um, at the art investor, which is an the underscore art underscore inv investor. But these days, if you just type in the art investor, I'm sure it'll come up. <laughs> yeah, algorithms. It didn't used to be the case. <laughs> <laughs> I love the algorithms. Okay. Um. <laughs> Where are we starting at the top? Cool. Okay. Um, image number one. Um, Excellent. Cool. Do you have names for all of them? I do, actually, wonderfully enough. I think maybe one or two of those are going to be untitled. Um, we start off here with a mixed media image um, on photographic paper um, titled A Younger, More Angrier Me. Um, done. I finished this in 2020. And it's, yeah, it's roughly about A4 size. And this work starts where I think most of my favorite works begin from, which is through some sort or aspect of something first failing and then me using, you know, that failure um, in a different way, maybe a few years later or a few months or maybe even in the same year. But what we're looking at here is basically um, light sensitive paper that was uh, accidentally exposed, so I couldn't use it in the red room when I was developing my photos. So I always just look at you know the materials I have around me um, in a more like upcycling way. Um, so this was basically a red um, ink dabber and a white ink dabber, you know, one that you get from Shelf Life that you use for um, graffiti tags, acrylic based ink. And it started off as like a, a sketch that I was planning to do a painting of, but just I guess the texture of the paper just really lent itself towards the ink and the image that you're looking at is, you know, one of my typical stylized portraits, um, kind of like a head and shoulder version of, you know, myself kind of, it is a self portrait, um, kind of divulging or trying to express my mental state as a young, um, as a kid, as a you know very emotional and emotionally turbulent and yeah, just a very messed up kid trying to express his anger on the world. Hence the red and the white, the chaos in the back, mm -hmm. the teeth, the mouth. But um, but also like it's very sort of um, adolescent. It's like an adolescent scribble, but it's also not filled in. So, mm. you know, you weren't the person that you were going to be yet. You know what I mean? You were like as yet inchoate like the painting yes. at the time. Yes, you know? exactly. I, and I like that because it was kind of like me reflecting on myself, um, reflecting on who I am, or who I was at that moment, who I and just negotiating the emotions and understanding that, that I'm not that person anymore, you know? It's like yeah. kind of like an ode to the person that I used to be, I guess. Yeah, like that. Cool. Okay, let's move on to image number two. Love it. Um, image number <laughs> two you're looking at is titled um, My Kind of People, and I will tell you why. Um, it was an acrylic painting that on cotton that I actually physically attached with hessian rope onto a pallet. How big are we talking? We are talking 90 by 100 centimeters. Cool. This is about a meter high, 90 wide. Um, and one of my figurative explorations um, and the figurative kind of style 
was born during um, my COVID experience where I was kind of locked on a ship um, traveling home from the Bahamas um, back to Cape Town um, on a ship, which basically took 120 days in total. <laughs> And my whole, yeah, it's funny What's now. What's that as a percentage of your life? You know, like yeah, I t- <laughs> I'm not a not a pri- not a not a happy amount of time. But whilst I was kind of stuck on the ship, um, I'd ordered like some paints off Amazon prior to lockdown and like some sketch paper, and I was just really um, obsessed with how people communicate with body language before words and how do we interpret body language? How do we interpret our own body language? And body language also as um, a tool of conveying, you know, deep sentiments. So hence the red was always for me my favorite color because it's, it's the most striking color. And I think the color that the human eye has the highest response to, but also, you know, the color of passion, um, hence, all these people are naked and faceless, but they're all connected. Um, that was very important for me. But I think through the title, you know, my kind of people, I was just kind of expressing the individuals in my life that I feel more drawn to, you know, and they are, they tend to always be, you know, the most vulnerable, um, the most passionate people that I can find and somehow we always are interconnected, you know, no. And I think that the reason why I didn't want to give them faces is because sometimes, you know, the face kind of solidifies their identity and I wanted it to be a universal image that, you know, people could maybe project themselves mm-hmm. into and project their own sense of like people that they feel attracted to into those um, bodies that you see over there. And yeah, the face would detract from body, the body language. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, and the color blue, just because blue for me has always been a color that symbolizes communication and connection. Um, so I think it tied in really beautifully with the red, also giving like this very two dimensional background so that you do only focus on the figures and not necessarily anything or anything distracting in the background. Almost looks like they're floating in the sky, mm. you know, communicating or just having some sort of moment with one another. It's really one of my favorite paintings, which I actually still have. No one's really popped their hands up, but... Maybe after this. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe after this. I knows? often people comment and say, like, is this for sale? Is it? And well, then hopefully, hope you're listening. <laughs> it is available. Yeah, this Adverse Podcast is not about <laughs> selling. It's just about it's showcasing <laughs> um, the artist, <laughs> not like, hey, buy these things. Yes. <laughs> This is not a sales marketing scheme, I promise. <laughs> cool. Um, image number three. Ooh, image number three um, is one of my favorite paintings that I've completed this year. It's titled uh, Zima Blue, and it is 100 centimeters by 120. And the reason why I titled it Zima Blue excuse me, is because... Zima Blue is one of my new favorite characters from uh, a really profound car- Netflix cartoon called Love, Death and Robots. But they really deal or try to communicate um, profound ideas and philosophies on like life and being and existence. So Zima Blue is like this character um, born as an AI but finds himself so perplexed with existence that the only way he can negotiate it is through creating art. So what Zima does is he creates his own hue of blue and it's called the Zima blue. That's exactly what an AI would do. That's what it's like kind of a computer thing. Exactly. You know? Yeah, (laughs) I love it. Um, Yeah. yeah. (laughs) It's like completely perplexed with my identity and reality. Let me just um, be an artist. Um, Is... Is there gun imagery here? There isn't a gun. There is no gun imagery. I've gotten a lot of different takes on this, which is very interesting. Um, someone also said to me that they see like a penis in it. And I was like, well, I can, I get you. Well, if, you if you want to see penises, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're, you're re- exactly. you'll, you'll see penises. <laughs> but I think, yeah, my work's always lent itself 
to the imagination of the viewer. You know, I've never enjoyed predetermining the meaning of my work. So whatever you do see, I think, is always a reflection on your own psyche and perception. <coughs> um, not really mine. Totally, yeah. Um, but as you can see, like, the, the very cubistic um, aspect and composition to it, multiple faces and mouths all indicating, you know, different directions and different kind of, I would say, like, like you said, like an X-ray beneath the surface of yeah. someone who is really perplexed with, you know, what it means to be alive and what it means to exist in all of this madness, chaos so and symmetry. Existentialism is, the, is a theme. Very much so. Um, but, but for me, like, uh, these look like bullets, you know, w- you know those, those, r- those like machine gun rifles. Oh, wow. W- where they have like strings of bullets. Yeah, and like yeah, 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 yeah. I yeah. see, like the SMG level. Um, I like this work was very different for me because it was a lot more minimalistic than anything I'd ever done before. Um, like the the blue background is very, very calm. You know, mm-hmm. I'm not, and it was never used to the calm backgrounds, but I really enjoyed what they did for like the, cen- the centrality of the image. Yeah. You know, the color essentially allows the image to look like it's in front of the of the the background instead of like receding you know it, it it's very it pushes the image kind of towards the viewer um because of its just because of its like its depth it's, yeah. it has depth but it's very flat um but with this painting it was actually the first time i was using uh plascon paints and not um you know your typical acrylics that you'd get in any art store that you'd walk into um, and like Plascon paint that you would use on a wall outside that would get rained on and UV exposure. And I started using those mm. paints in uh, on my canvases, which I really enjoyed. Um, the blue inside the mouth is not the same as this blue. You no, like it's not. That's, per- that's on purpose, obviously. Yes, it is. Because I was just thinking, like, if it was the same, it would look much more hollow. Like, it would yes. It would be a com- different feel, you completely, know? Completely, completely. Okay, well, I mean, so when I saw that, I was like, did he think about that? Like, you know what I mean? Like, this is what yeah. I... Yeah. Really, it's really interesting, you know. He did think about that. Um, I see guns, I see satellite satellite dishes, you know, Dope. and a m- middle finger. Yes, always a big fuck you to the world. <laughs> Excuse my language. No, um, there's lots of swearing on this podcast. Okay, okay, I've good. checked all the boxes that say not for kids. Okay, and this wonderful. This podcast contains explicit material. There we go. <laughs> Just, I've been censoring myself the whole show. Oh, That's I should have told you in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, image number four. Uh, yes, here, image number four. We're looking at um, the biggest artwork that I've actually ever completed in my career. Or oh, video number four, because this might be a video. Yeah. We well, still haven't decided. Whatever it is. <laughs> hope you guys can <laughs> see and enjoy four. it. Work number four. Um, and it's titled Open Sea, and uh, it's actually 10 meters wide by 5.2 meters high and was installed in the Black Brick Hotel, um, basically like on the inside of the courtyard. And yeah, it was definitely my hardest project and um, one of the works that doesn't, that very much sticks out alongside any of my own, you know, it's not a it's not a portrait it's not um anything neo-expressionistic it's if anything just a very minimal um response to uh the concept that i devised with black brick to start my residency and what i did was basically just took some inspiration from the floor plans of the building during its construction and its original construction was actually completed in 1951 and um, I wanted to kind of express a minimal rendition or version. How I'd like to say it is like, the, it's the floor plans put through my imagination, but through that, I wanted to communicate how the vertical village of Black Brick consists of different people and ideas and perceptions um, overlaying mm. with one another and kind of how that might kind of create this geometric maze or path that, you know, we all kind of are on. Um, What was really interesting about this work was that whilst it was laid out on the floor together, it actually had 
the sense of a maze that you, it's something mm. that you could actually physically get onto and walk through which i didn't predetermine but once i finally saw everything like that on the day of installation i was like holy shit yeah. this actually would be an amazing tapestry or an amazing carpet and you know where the where the rectangles do overlay i used a color named fuchsia fizz and that was kind of just to mark you know what happens when two different identities or perceptions kind of overlay the, the red right yes and like I an x-ray through yeah yeah and it's like well two people that kind of connect in a different way might create a new color you know kind of considering people and individuals as different colors and the meeting of those individuals or their relationships as a new color formed you know um mm. was extremely <coughs> really difficult and three and a half weeks of new challenges every day and you know for the first time actually needed a team of people to assist me with this um it was probably about three or four people um who either helped paint lay down the tape um so the canvases together reinforce the canvases you know the the rope installation contractors who essentially um secured it onto the wall vertically and now it's actually only visible to the people who have apartments that face inwards here at black brick from like level 1 which we're on up to level 3 So it's actually considered like an artwork for all of those um residents specifically it's like their view. Yeah. Um yeah, I had a lot of fun with this and I'm excited to work at this scale. I definitely decided to use the minimalism because of the effort and like the magnitude of the work. I think if I had tried to make something like that size <coughs> in my like cubistic yeah. portraiture technique it would have been uh very different very like different <laughs> and taken a whole lot longer um yeah. they pretty much told me to like start this project three weeks before my residency was supposed to begin just because we couldn't determine when it would be done mm. you know um but yeah but y- like it's, it's three weeks from start to finish yeah So three weeks of you like thinking about nothing else doing nothing else missioning straight up it was so hard <laughs> I <laughs> once um made some desks from scratch like I um which is not something I normally do um but I welded them together and I particle coded them and everything it took me two weeks of in my holidays or whatever yeah. so you two know two weeks of welding of like dude what? it's crazy and then all the time you're thinking like oh my word this should only take three days or yeah. you know and it doesn't you yeah. know um <laughs> biggest challenge was like finding a wall that size to like tape it up and paint it you know but like after after the after like two weeks you start to go and crazy like you're like this is the only thing i'm thinking about i need to get it done like this, like i you, you know what i mean like like a two weeks of I'm having <laughs> dreams about doing this yeah. like <laughs> like it is on my table yeah, yeah it's like bleeding into my <laughs> sleep time and I'm just thinking about <laughs> rectangles at like a 45 degree angle and nothing else um it was a lot but um such a amazing opportunity again and so proud of the way I was able to execute it awesome. I dig it cool um image number five. Ooh. One of my favorites. Um this is titled um <coughs> My Way of Life slash Modus Vivendi and um Modus Vivendi being a Latin term for kind of the English derivative of my way of life or more like understanding of life with life, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um so like how the, does like do you think of like joie de vivre, like the, the joy of life? Like yes, yeah, exactly. Modus like Yes. Your, um, the, your mode of living life yeah. yes you know the way you negotiate the fact that you're here mm-hmm. um and i completed this in 2020 it was acrylic and oil that's paint that's what you said the, the the way in which you negotiate the fact that you're here yes that's like a really cool way of saying life you know basically i like yeah yeah that was a good one so <laughs> picking that up <laughs> thanks for picking that up yeah the yeah. way of negotiating that you're here um And it's so funny that Modus Vivendi came to me um I listen to music a lot if I, if it wasn't art then I definitely would have found myself in music like I cannot go a single day 
mm. an hour of the day without listening to music, especially when I'm working. It's like yeah. like my like my life force comes from music. What so what genres? Um alternative hip hop, R and B, classical music, jazz. Hip hop and rap. You mentioned jazz. That's good. <laughs> yes. No. Jazz is very important. But, but jazz is is difficult to listen to if you don't know what's going on. Like if you don't play jazz, it's difficult to listen to. Do you find it like? Um, what do you mean? It's difficult. It's a bit, it's a bit harsh. To. Some of it is a bit harsh for people because they c- don't understand. Okay, what he's doing is he's you know. I think this the same could be said for art. You know, and maybe the sa- that's the reason why everyone's so intimidated by it is because. Yeah. They don't know what's going on, but I I feel that people can still enjoy th- things that they don't understand yeah. h- how it gets created or That's how it point, gets made. Yeah. I think that I think jazz music because of its historical yeah, placement and its significance, yeah. it's it's very powerful. And as for me, someone that's like grown up, you know, a- with ADHD, jazz music always made sense to me because it would either be inspired out of spontaneity or it would be inspired with you know a group of musicians like actually just playing coming yeah. together and I don't mean playing in the sense of playing a music instrument I mean in this word like playing like opposite of work like yeah. having fun people yeah. would just come and be childlike and have fun and to hit notes and sequences of music that weren't traditionally accepted but somehow all of those musicians were on the each other's frequency or same mm. page, you know. So, people like John Coltrane, um, Miles Davis. <coughs> I mean, yo, the list is actually so yeah. endless yeah. with you know influential um, jazz musicians that have also really impacted fine art. Um, so the the modus vivendi at the time was a album that one of my art favorite artists had released, um, 070 Shake. And her album was very much inspired on, you know, communicating mental health and um, vulnerability and intimacy. So this work began with me spray painting something black that I already had done underneath. So you can look at the bottom of the painting and kind of see like this orange hue and gray hue. So that was something that I'd done prior and just hated it. So I ended up spray painting half of the canvas black and then starting with like my geometric um, shapes in the back. And I had like this face, which was just like color blocks and this like red kind of portrait frame thing going. And that it probably stayed like that for about two months, just sitting like in the corner of my apartment when I was in Camps Bay and I remember looking at it um, this one day, I think after re-watching <laughs> John Michel so, so, so We're talking black background, red, and the geometric sort of uh, turquoise and yes. yellow stuff without the um, face, without there the There was nothing head. there, yeah. Cool. And you were thinking, hmm, this needs something. Yeah, I mean, I was looking at the color blocking and kind of the the, the composition that I'd created, and I, was, I, I didn't... I started off thinking, okay, face here, nose there eye there, forehead, the gold always indicates where I feel like the mouth will be. And it took me really long because the only way I knew I could have completed this painting was if I could find a material <clears throat> that would allow me to do like a consistent black line without like having to like retouch. So like acrylic doesn't let you do that. And oil also necessarily doesn't let you do that. You mean like if you put the black line then it other colors would show through. Yeah. So yeah. also, but how do I get a 20 centimeter long black line and consistent line without lifting my brush off of the page? Oh, okay. So I figured out that if I basically mixed turps with spray paint, I was able to get a very ink-like... Antimatter. You, basically. You <laughs> basically <laughs> antimatter. It's very, very sciencey now. <laughs> so... I would like spray the, the, the spray paint in a container and then obviously it's like condensed liquid or gas that is liquid and then kind of diluted with turps, which I guess breaks down the particles to a degree. And then it, it just allowed me to 
create these amazing, thick, strong black lines, which once I started, <clears throat> I didn't stop. So all those back lines just came out probably in the space of 30 or 40 minutes. And by the time I was looking at it again, it was, it was complete. It was this amazing amalgamation of lines and shape <coughs> and form that had now allowed me to summarize, like I said, the chaos in the background. And I think the black lines, especially because of my use of the strong verticals and horizontals, they always have a, a very grounding feeling. Summarize, yeah, bringing it together. Yeah, right. they always always use the strong verticals to like give you a sense of being grounded. I always want the, the canvas to kind of make you feel like, yes, it is very esoteric and out there, but one thing you can understand yeah. is, is the form. And yeah. once you can understand the form, everything else, I guess, becomes less important. So, <clears throat> you know, my way of life, in, in order to describe the painting for me was always figuring out or in, a, in a way describing how do we summarize you know the chaos and that is in our lives you know and using using symmetry and just understanding that chaos isn't chaos once it's able to create shape and form you know people always think of chaos as like things that are very sporadic and unmanageable and just like out out of hand but chaos can definitely be understood through symmetry and mm. i think a, a lot of the way i perceive my life and the things that i do in my life are a complete balance of chaos and symmetry so for me this painting was just like the perfect description of that mm. um it's very um, blessed to have it sell L last year um, and it's actually now in a very um, special collection on its way to Ghana, and yeah, it's one of my one of my favorites actually, definitely. Awesome. Cool. So, um, image number six. Image number six. Here we are um, at one of my copper and etching artworks with charcoal on Fabriano. Um, one of my most exciting kind of adventures, I think. And it kind of began <clears throat> with me wanting to move away from like the figurative aspect and focus on, I guess you can call it portraiture or my version of portraiture. So I, anything that I create or doesn't work out and you know, the vision that I might've had for it, I always keep. So I had these failed copper etchings from a printmaking course in 2017. And I kept them and they just had, just had an ambiance about them or a life that I was really intrigued with. And when I was kind of stumbling onto um, George Kondo, I felt like these, these etchings would have like really lent themselves well. I mean, if you look at the artwork, it has typically with the, the paintings a very chaotic background um, but the chaotic background I guess in terms of the composition with the central figure kind of looks like what's going on in their head you know it kind of looks like the thought process or for me personally like I would say like that's what my brain looks like or that's what it feels like sometimes in you know situations it's different colors, different thoughts, different patterns, almost very scatterbrained. Mm. Um, so the, the title is um, One on Each Shoulder. And I guess that kind of speaks towards the whole mythology of having, you know, a devil on one shoulder and the angel on the next, and just having these two forces of duality always informing, you know, the decisions you make, you know, you always <coughs> either decide to make the decision of like the higher route or the higher path and then you sometimes d decide to listen to the other voice that is more um, malicious or more self-centered or egotistic or narcissistical um, and just I think in this artwork I was trying to describe what it felt like to you know be conflicted with that sense of duality of good and bad and good and evil light and dark and how all of us actually do have those sides of us. And I think like the two faces you can see, or you can actually see more than two, 
but specifically, you know, the one with the big eye on just the left hand side, the one on the right, both have like open mouths because they're both like demanding, you know, the central figure's attention and mm. kind of you can feel the sense of movement of I, I want to look left or I want to look right and I'm entertaining both and I'm torn, but I'm still looking forward at, you know, the decision I have to make and so, so not only are there two eyes of, of the face that's looking at us, there's a face on the right looking to our right. Yes, and there's that a also face. has an eye which is looking at us, like yeah. kind of like a bird's bird's side eye view. But yeah. like, yeah, I see that now. Yeah, that, that is an L there that represents another face. Exactly. Like two but face. Yeah, there's. I mean, even one if you like look by the nose connected to that eye, it leads down into mm. two more eyes. And then uh, it yeah. leads down into... There's a nose there. The, yeah, the, um, yeah. There's actually two so noses on either side. Like halfway... So we're, we're, we're looking halfway down on the left-hand side. There's yeah. That triangle is a nose. Yeah. Well, and can be a nose. Exactly. And I mean, what I love about my work is the longer you look at it, the more you see and... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm, I'm seeing Sam, Samurai Jack's hat here. From there the, we go. Oh, <laughs> yes. I love that. Yeah. I, mean, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> In, in, I'm very inane observations, but you know, every, yeah, everyone sees different different stuff. Yeah. Definitely, um, but yeah, these surprisingly enough, I intended on them being sketches for paintings, but you know, the, these were all actually original drawings that actually performed better as just unique works of art, which I was really attracted to, and all of them actually found a home either in a collector or with a gallery, so these really inspired me to keep this language or investigate more what this language could be in a larger s a sense of the word. Like these are very small. They're only 22 by 33 centimeters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, image number seven. Ooh, image number seven actually comes from my last body of work that I completed in... Um, Michaela's. There was another work that went with it called um, Life, Death and Other Symbols. I think I left this specific one untitled, but at this stage in my life or in my career, I was more concerned with um, archiving systems. And when I mean archiving systems, I mean how do we as people archive information? Yeah. Um, and, you know, one of those systems would be language. And we, you know, we use language in books. We use text to essentially describe the information we want to keep. But how do we look at other um, language or writing systems as archiving systems mm. or archiving processes? So this was an exploration of me creating my own alphabet or my own body of symbols that were inspired obviously by Retna, the famous um, Los Angeles graffiti and contemporary artist and at the time my entire body of work was <coughs> looking at how do we dissect European concepts of like I said archiving and informational systems so the importance of this artwork is that I'm the only one that knows what it says you know and the power of meaning is essentially left with the artist yeah. instead of the power of meaning being given to the viewer but in that sense what these symbols do in terms of anyone that gazes upon it is it's, it's immediately like an invocation of emotions it's very emotionally provocative I mean the strong red verticals with the dripping ink yeah. it's very oh, it's very spatially aware there's a lot of sense of a uh, geometry in it yeah. and conceptually like i said it i mean this was huge this was like it's almost two meters wide by one point two meters high by 1.5 wide um it's a style that i do use still um to this day and it's a style that i use to do really really big works um however i did feel <coughs> like it wasn't the only style that i wanted to teach myself or explore hmm. um, and now I'm, I can still like use you know my own made homemade alphabet I like to call it to describe how I'm feeling or a sentence it's you know kind of moving away from the English language and 
what is it and like interrogating what it looks like for us as people to create our own system of communication mm. um i really like that like it has a sense of form in that these are bigger like the mm. smaller things are stacked on the bigger things you know what i mean so mm. like it doesn't look like if you took away the borders like it would like stay yes you know I mean? yes like <laughs> yes yeah i really really enjoyed these works um cool. and yeah i actually make these really quickly the, like that is literally just um lithographic ink and oil on wood on super wood so at the time i was majoring in printmaking and was not really satisfied with the scale that i was allowed to work with in printmaking like yeah. in printmaking like you saw in the previous drawings with the etchings yeah. it's very small it's like 20 or 30 centimeters it's a page and i really had the necessity to um how does basque yet say um boom for real <laughs> so i wanted i wanted my work to really <laughs> take up more space and demand attention i think that's what the work mm -hmm. was for me and like using you know printmaking medium like lithographic ink and even then i was mixing it with terps and experimenting on even like a scientific level and I was really, really happy with how these came out. Yeah, really cool. Cool. Yeah. Um, image number eight. Ooh, <coughs> image number eight is actually untitled, but it is a commissioned work that I completed for the South African hip-hop artist A. Reese. So if you take out your phone, if you have Apple Music or Spotify and you type in A. Reese, Today's Tragedy, Tomorrow's Memory, you will see this image. Um, this image, well, the album has received over 14 million plays on Spotify and I think over 20 million plays on Apple Music. So this was one of my paintings um, that found itself on a, I would say, a cross-discipline platform that received a lot of attention, you know, for the first time. Mm. I was able to see my artwork um, signifying someone else's creative project you know so this artwork was born from me um getting the mixtape the album months prior to you know it being released into the world and spending i think it was three to four solid months just listening to his music and his music alone and creating what i felt was a visual language or composition of the feelings that i was receiving from the album um so I feel like the music informed the composition, it informed the characters and the, what I was trying to kind of show here was just the different types of people that we sometimes become in order to achieve our dreams or after the world has kind of put us through strain and mm. t trials and tribulations, you know, being passion driven, being money driven, being power driven and anxious be anxious being hurt um this is definitely one of my favorite works and something that i'm extremely proud of and just and un undoubtedly something i will remember forever awesome so i dig it it's really cool thank you <laughs> i really enjoyed that yeah so that is acrylic paint and charcoal on cotton and yeah um i sent the original to Reese so that he could frame it and you know have it pay homage to like his amazing like musical accolade for the rest of his life and you know so glad that the whole world has access to it just simply yeah. by yeah. going on their phones and not needing to um go into a gallery or anything like that and yeah like i was saying this is specifically the image that so many like young kids and youth yeah have been like painting if you and take out like i don't know like i don't know like okay offspring is like the first thing that came to my mind or like blink 182 like one of the funniest um pictures reminded me of the nurse from the blink 182 yes. album. yes like it's like an image ingrained in my in like your, in your subconscious psyche. like yeah from a young age and yeah. this will be maybe you know it, it, it is it is this this will be this is something that like kids will remember for the rest of their lives you know yeah. they're always consider you know reese and samurai for eyes collaboration or even samurai for eyes visual aspect as an extension of you know yeah. a reese's music so i always am very happy to find myself collaborating um across disciplines 
I think it's just incredibly important for us as South African artists to work together, to merge, you know, our capacities together and just to also inform and teach the rest of, you know, the country and the kids growing up now that anyone can be an artist. Yeah. That art isn't this thing that should be intimidating or swayed away from and I'm really yeah, just really, really proud of this one actually. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. Uh image number nine. Ooh. Image number nine is titled The Crisis of Acceptance. It was completed in twenty eighteen and showcased again in twenty nineteen. And it's basically acrylic and litho acrylic paint and lithographic ink on glass. Um and it's 113 centimeters by 114 so it's quite large and um, one of the first times I actually worked directly onto glass um, with you know my calligraphic style um, and the title the crisis of acceptance for me was more of like a emotional statement on just how hard it is to accept the things in our lives that we have no power and control over so the white that you see at the bottom was actually applied on the back of the glass and the black and red that overlap each other was on the front and um, once like all the ink dries which is actually after a few weeks it's got an amazing texture to it and a feeling and I always invite any of my viewers to like you know put rub their hand against the surface cool. engage with like the yeah. materiality of it the smoothness of the glass and you know the texture of the ink that's now dried and you know what it, what does it mean to like rub your hand on the symbol and then go into the glass but still see the symbol and, not and if, feel it like if one day maybe like it gets worn away by people touching it like that'll be part of the art exactly like and you know i, I mean? love that i really love that so yeah it was just an ode to the process of accepting anything in our lives which always seems to be a crisis and or just uh, uh, something something that's really hard to do, you know, but something that you have to do nonetheless. Cool. Awesome. Um, image number ten. Yes, this lovely, lovely artwork over here, if I might say so myself, is titled <laughs> um, "States of Mind." Um, I completed this last year, 2020, and it was acrylic paint, charcoal and charcoal on cotton and 96 by 100 centimeters um this was actually sold through the fourth gallery and was actually acquired uh, by the same collector that uh, took home um my way of life the modus vivendi artwork which i'm really happy about uh this artwork for me was it was very significant for me because i was just going through some stuff at the time and I was really interested in how you know in one day one person can chop and change through so many feelings you know you might start your morning off feeling fantastic and find yourself completely depressed by midday and find yourself in a completely headspace by the evening and essentially so drained from all of those emotional experiences but this artwork for me was trying to describe you know just different that how different states of mind can also come across as you being a different completely different person um i decided to use you know these these really stylized colors like the baby blue and the baby pink with like this monochromatic feel because i feel like the the color scheme was completely opposite to the motif you know i think the sentiments of the artwork were a lot darker and then I felt like I used the colors to kind yeah. of satirize or just create a more a, a warm kind of association with that feeling. Yeah. I mean, satirize, like, that's exactly right. Like, yeah. make it more playful, more humor yeah. humorous. Like, don't take itself so seriously. Like, exactly. yeah, imagine without the colors, it would be very hectic. Yeah, it would be very dark. And I, you know, what I like about this painting specifically is that it it's very striking, but for some reason so many people resonated with this i 
looked at this and I still do look at this artwork as completely unfinished. You know, not a lot of people know, but now I'll make everyone know. <laughs> <laughs> I actually finished this artwork on the floor of the gallery like a day later than I was supposed to deliver it. So like here's me like a bunch of other famous artists around me and like I'm sitting on the floor with like my <laughs> piece of charcoal and like my hairspray like finishing up this thing and you know god behold the week after it sold and people were fighting over it and i mean that just goes to show that the artist's eye is never the same eye that the, the people around you or the, the people that might see this artwork have mm. you know i look at it as something that maybe i rushed or didn't complete but someone else ha looks at it and just has this completely different feeling mm. um and you know on that note of like using those colors i always feel like my paintings have a very cartoonish feeling to them and i think that i i use that purposefully because i st i use the cartoon motif to describe very deep and you know dark feelings or thoughts or concepts that you know are either like bugging me or that i'm observing in and around the world so when it's very hard for me or for I think people to like take cartoons seriously. You know, people are always like, ah, oh, Popeyes, blah, blah, blah. But I feel like some of the most and some of the deepest sentiments or critiques on like human beings and like us as a people come from cartoons. I mean, if you look at uh, Zapiro and you yeah. look at Madame and Eve, uh, you look at Bitter Comics, people use cartoons to really talk about things that are very important that most people don't want to talk about, you know, um, emotional, political, psychological. Um, so that's, I guess, what we're looking at here. Mm. Yeah, also one of my favorites. I mm. wish I actually kept that one. <laughs> awesome. Okay, cool. Well, um, let's get into the quick uh, medium fair round. Like you can answer these in wh wh whichever way you want. Like okay. we can go on tangents, but we can also you can also answer them real quick. Okay. And then after that, there's a rapid fire, no think, yes or no around, which you're not allowed to think about. You just go yes or no. Perfect. <laughs> okay, Love cool. it. So, yeah. is there something you would advise young artists to cultivate early? Perseverance, self-esteem, being able to hear the word no, being able to be rejected, and always being brave enough to experiment with new things that you've never tried. Mm. Like like Miles Davis. Like you come to Miles Davis concert and he like he wouldn't play like Yeah, I'd turn his back to the entire crowd. And, and he wouldn't play so what? He'd play like some other thing. Like yeah. he just plays new weird stuff, you know? <laughs> and unapologetic <laughs> completely. Um so who's your favorite artist and why? Uh Jean Michel Basquiat, undoubtedly just because a lot of his base traits and characteristics I think informed my own practice and mm. my own approach towards my creativity and the things you've mentioned already you know yeah like um o total total like openness like not willing to did you mention uh, while recording or while we're recording like he wouldn't sort of pander to the powers that be he would just you know always just I don't think we mentioned it but to always be unapologetic and yeah sure of of yourself and your work regardless of external opinions yeah, yeah. um yeah definitely my favorite artist um natural creativity or determination like or what's the percentage split i would definitely say determination because um talent can only go so far mm. until a certain point and determination is the only thing you know determination and discipline is what carries talent into the final quarter you know i believe yeah. Um, to be determined is to not necessarily be talented, but to be disciplined enough to put the hours in and to try hard and to mm. work hard, regardless of, you know, the fruits of your labor, which I think is the most important thing for an artist. Cool. Um, if you weren't involved in art, what would you be doing? Would definitely be doing music. What genre? Um, I'd like to say hip hop, but I'm... I think that my... Oh, 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 you were on Spotify, no? Like you, you were on a track or something. Yeah, on YouTube. I've got a few songs on no, YouTube. No, but you're on Spotify as well. It says featuring... Yeah, yes, featuring Simon Fra Yeah, with my friend Anele, actually. Yeah, I've been... 
I've got a bunch of music out in the world on the internet that not a lot oh, of people wow, know okay. about. <laughs> yeah. I've got a music video on um, YouTube if anyone wants to watch that. <laughs> but yeah, definitely music if it wasn't art. Cool. Um, what do you think the most telling signs are for the future success of an emerging artist? I think the most telling signs are an artist's ability to explore, to experiment, and to always want to learn something new. I think as soon as artists fall into either a contract, a binding contract with galleries, you know, three to five years. Or greatest hits, like doing their greatest hits. Yeah, exactly. You know, you re, you're trying to relive something that you did five years ago. Yeah. I think that once that happens, you can start seeing the stagnation and kind of it's not fresh anymore. Mm. I think that's one of the signs for me. Um, if you could have any three artists, dead or alive, over for dinner, who would they be? George Kondo, Jean-Michel Basquiat, and Marcel Duchamp. Cool. Okay, so these are the rapid fire, yes, no. Uh, you can't look at them. Can't look. <laughs> Sneaking. There'll be a million people on on Mars before we die. Yes. Work life balance. No. One day people won't age past their prime. Yes. People should give up shaking hands forever. No. Art critics are a valuable and crucial net benefit to society. No. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much for coming <laughs> on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an amazing time and conversation. And yeah, I look forward to doing it again soon, hopefully. Awesome. Cool, cool.